In this Applied Data Science Crash Course, you'll learn all about A-B testing, from the concepts to the practical details they can apply in business. A-B testing is commonly used in data science. It's an experiment on two variants to see which performs better based on a given metric. This course merges in-depth statistical analysis with the kind of data science theories big tech firms rely on. Tata from Lunar Tech developed this course. She is a very experienced data scientist and teacher. Welcome to the hands-on A-B testing crash course, where we will do some refreshment when it comes to A-B testing. If you're looking for that one course where you can learn and quickly refresh your memory for A-B testing and how to actually do an A-B testing case study hands-on in Python, then you are in the right place. In this crash course, we are going to refresh our memory for the A-B test design, including the power analysis and defining those different parameters such as minimum detectable effect, statistical significance level, and also the uh, type 2 probability, so the power of the test. And then we are going to do hands-on case study project where we will be conducting an A-B testing results analysis in Python. At the end of this course, you can expect to know everything about designing an A-B test, what it means as to design a proper A-B test and how to do an A-B test results analysis in Python in a proper way. I'm Date Vaslian, co-founder at Lunar Tech, and I have been in data science for the last five years. I've learned A-B testing end-to-end -end after following numerous blogs and numerous research papers and courses. And I've noticed that there is not a one place, one course, that will cover all the fundamentals and necessary stuff, both the theory and implementation in Python in one place. And that's about to change, as we have this crash course that will help you to do exactly that, to learn how to design an A-B test in a proper way as a good and solid data scientist and to showcase your skills by doing Python A-B testing results analysis. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment to help the algorithm to make this content more accessible to everyone across the world. And if you want to get free resources, make sure to check the free resources section at lunartech.ai. And if you want to become a job-ready data scientist and you are looking for this accessible bootcamp that will help you to make a job-ready data scientist, consider enrolling to the data science bootcamp. So whether you are a product scientist, whether you are a data analyst, data scientist, or a product manager who wants to learn about A-B testing at high level and how it can be done in Python, then you are in the right place. Because in this crash course, we are going to refresh our memory what it means to properly design an A-B test, which means doing power analysis and also calculating the sample size by hand by following the statistical guidelines and ensuring that everything is done properly. And then as the second part of this crash course, we are also going to do a hands-on case study in Python when it comes to performing A-B testing results analysis. So we are going to cover all these important concepts such as p-values, sample size, and also uh, interpreting the A-B test results using standard error, calculating those uh, estimates, pooled variants, and then evaluating the A-B test results, including confidence interval, generalizability of the results, reproducibility of the results. So without further ado, let's get started. A-B testing is an important topic for data scientists to know because it's a powerful method for evaluating changes or improvements to the products or services. It allows us to make data-driven decisions by comparing the performance of two different versions of a product or a service, usually referred as treatment or control. For example, A-B testing allows data scientists to measure the effectiveness of changes to a product or a service, which is important as it enables data scientists to make data-driven decisions rather than relying on intuition or assumptions. Secondly, A-B testing helps data scientists to identify the most effective changes to a product or a service, which is really important because it allows us to optimize the performance of a product or a service, which can then lead to increased customer satisfaction and sales. A-B testing helps us also to validate certain hypotheses about what changes will improve a product or a service. This is important because it helps us to build a deeper understanding of the customers and the factors that influence customers' behavior. Finally, 
A-B testing is a common practice in many industries such as e-commerce, digital marketing, website optimization, and many others. So data scientists who have knowledge and experience in A-B testing will be more valuable to these companies. No matter in which industry you want to enter as a data scientist and what kind of job you will be interviewed for, and even if you believe more technical data science is your cup of tea, be prepared to know at least high-level understanding and the details behind this method. It will definitely help you to know about this topic when you are speaking with product owners, stakeholders, product scientists, and other people involved in the business. Let's briefly discuss a perfect audience for this section of the course and prerequisites. There are no prerequisites of this section in terms of A-B testing concepts that you should know already. But knowing the basics in statistics, which you can find in the Fundamentals to Statistics section, is highly recommended. This section will be great if you have no prior A-B testing knowledge and you want to identify and learn the essential A-B testing concepts from scratch. So this will help you to prepare for your job interviews. It will also be a good refresher for anyone who does have A-B testing knowledge but who wants to refresh their memory or want to fill in the gaps in their knowledge. In this lecture, we will start off the topic about A-B testing, where we will formally define what A-B testing is, and we will look at the high-level overview of A-B testing process step by step. By definition, A-B testing or split testing is originated from the statistical randomized control trials and is one of the most popular ways for businesses to test new UX features, new versions of a product, or an algorithm to decide whether your business should launch that new UX feature or should productionalize that new recommender system, create that new product, that new button, or that new algorithm. The idea behind A-B testing is that you should show the variated or the new version of the product to a sample of customers, often referred as experimental group, and the existing version of the product to another sample of customers, referred as control group. Then the difference in the product performance in experimental versus control group is tracked to identify the effect of these new versions of the product on the performance of the product. So the goal is then to track the metric during the test period and find out whether there is a difference in the performance of the product and what type of difference is it. The motivation behind this test is to test new product variants that will improve the performance of the existing product and will make this product more successful and optimal showing a positive treatment effect. What makes this testing great is that businesses are getting direct feedback from their actual users by presenting them the existing versus the variated product version, and in this way they can quickly test new ideas. In case of A-B test shows that the variated version is not effective, at least businesses can learn from this and can decide whether they need to improve it or need to look for other ideas. Let us go through the steps included in the A-B testing process, which will give you a higher level overview into the process. The first step in conducting A-B testing is stating the hypothesis of the A-B test. This is the process that includes coming up with business and statistical hypothesis that you would like to test with this test, including how you measure the success, which we will call primary metric. Next step in A-B testing is to perform what we call power analysis and design the entire test, which includes making assumptions about the most important parameters of the test and calculate the minimum sample size required to claim statistical significance. The third step in A-B testing is to run the actual A-B test, which in practical sense for the data scientist means making sure that the test runs smoothly and correctly, collaborate with engineers and product managers to ensure that all the requirements are satisfied. This also includes collecting the data of control and experimental groups, which will be used in the next step. Next step in A-B testing is choosing the right statistical test, whether it is Z-test, T-test, chi-square test, etc., to test the hypothesis from the step 1 by using the data collected from the previous step, and to determine whether there is a statistically significant difference between the control versus experimental group. The fifth and the final step in A-B testing is continuing to analyze the results and find out whether besides statistical significance, there is also practical significance. In this step, we use the second step's power analysis, so all the assumptions that we made about model parameters and the sample size, and the fourth step's results to determine whether there is a practical significance beside of the statistical significance. 
This summarizes the A-B testing process at a high level. In the next couple of lectures, we'll go through the steps one at a time. So buckle up and let's learn about A-B testing. In this lecture, lecture number two, we will discuss the first step in A-B testing process. So let's bring our diagram back. As you can recall from the previous lecture, when we were discussing the entire process of A-B testing at a high level, we saw that in the first step in conducting A-B testing is stating the hypothesis of A-B test. This process includes coming up with a business and statistical hypothesis that you would like to test with this test, including how you measure the success, which we call a primary metric. So what is the metric that we can use to say that, that the product that we are testing performs well? First, we need to state the business hypothesis for our A-B test from a business perspective. So formally, business hypothesis describes what the two products are that being compared and what is the desired impact or the difference for the businesses. So how to fix a potential issue in the product where a solution of these two problems will influence the, what we call a key performance indicator or the KPI of the interest. Business hypothesis is usually set as a result of brainstorming and collaboration of relevant people on the product team and data science team. The idea behind this hypothesis is to decide how to fix a potential issue in the product where a solution of these problems will improve the target KPI. One example of business hypothesis is that changing the color of learn more button, for instance, to green will increase the engagement of the web page. Next, we need to select what we call primary metric for our A-B testing. There should be only a one primary metric in your A-B test. Choosing this metric is one of the most important parts of A-B test, since this metric will be used to measure the performance of the product or feature for the experimental and control groups, and then will be used to identify whether there is a difference or what we call statistically significant difference between these two groups. By definition, primary metric is a way to measure the performance of the product being tested in the A-B test for the experimental and control groups. It will be used to identify whether there is a statistically significant difference between these two groups. The choice of the success metric depends on the underlying hypothesis that is being tested with this A-B test. This is, if not the most, one of the most important parts of the A-B test because it determines how the test will be designed and also how well the proposed ideas perform. Choosing poor metrics might disqualify a large amount of work or might result in wrong conclusions. For instance, the revenue is not always the end goal. Therefore, in A-B testing, we need to tie up the primary metric to the direct and the higher level goals of the product. The expectation is that if the product makes more money, then this suggests the content is great. But in achieving that goal, instead of improving the overall content of the material and writing, one can just optimize the conversion funnels. One way to test the accuracy of the metric you have chosen as your primary metric for your A-B test could be to go back to the exact problem you want to solve. You can ask yourself the following question, what I tend to call the metric validity question. So if the chosen metric were to increase significantly while well, everything else stays constant, would we achieve our goal and would we address our business problem? Is it higher revenue? Is it higher customer engagement or is it high views that we are chasing in the business? So the choice of the metric will then answer this question. Though you need to have a single primary metric for your A-B test, you still need to keep an eye on the remaining metrics to make sure that all the metrics are showing a change and not only the target one. Having multiple metrics in your A-B test will lead to false positives since you will identify many significant differences while there is no effect which is something you want to avoid. So it's always a good idea to pick just a single primary metric, but to keep an eye and monitor all the remaining metrics. So if the answer to the metric validity question is higher revenue, which means that you are saying that the higher revenue is what you are chasing and better performance means higher revenue for your product, then you can use as your primary metric what we call a conversion rate. Conversion rate is a metric that is used to measure the effectiveness of a website, a product, or a marketing campaign. It is typically used to determine the percentage of visitors or customers who take a desired action such as making a purchase, filling out a form, or signing up for a service. The formula for conversion rate is 
conversion rate is equal to number of conversions divided to number of total visitors multiplied by 100%. For example, if a website has 1,000 visitors and 50 of them make a purchase, the conversion rate would be equal to 50 divided to 1,000 multiplied by 100%, which gives us 5%. This means that our conversion rate in this case is equal to 5%. Conversion rate is an important metric because it allows us and businesses to measure the effectiveness of their website, a product, or a marketing campaign. It can help businesses to identify areas for improvement, such as increasing the number of conversions or improving the user experience. Conversion rate can be used for different purposes. For example, if a company wants to measure the effectiveness of an online store, the conversion rate would be the percentage of visitors who make a purchase and on the other hand, if a company wants to measure the effectiveness of landing page, the conversion rate would be the percentage of visitors who fill out a form or sign up for a service. So if the answer to the metric validity question is higher engagement, then you can use the click-through rate or CTR as your primary metric. This is, by the way, a common metric used in A-B testing whenever we are dealing with e-commerce product, search engine, recommender system, Click-through rate or the CTR is a metric that measures the effectiveness of a digital marketing campaign or the user engagement or some feature on your web page or your website, and it's typically used to determine the percentage of users who click on a specific link or a button or call to action CTA out of the total number of users who view it. The formula for the click-through rate can be represented as follows. So the CTR is equal to number of clicks divided to number of impressions multiplied by 100% not to be confused with click-through probability, because there is a difference between the click-through rate and click-through probability. For example, if an online advertisement receives thousands of impressions, which means that we are showing it to the customers for a thousand times, and there were 25 clicks, which means 25 out of all these impressions resulted in clicks, this means that the click-through rate for this specific example would be equal to 25 divided to 1,000 multiplied by 100%, which gives us 2.5%. This means that for this particular example, our click-through rate is equal to 2.5%. Click-through rate is an important metric because it allows businesses to measure the effectiveness of their digital marketing campaigns and their user engagement with their website or web pages. High click-through rate indicates that a campaign or the web page or feature is relevant and appealing to the target audience because they are clicking on it, while low click-through rate indicates that a campaign or the web page needs an improvement. Click-through rate can be used to measure the performance of different digital marketing channels, such as paid search, dis display advertising, email marketing, and social media. It can also be used to measure the performance of different ad formats, such as text advertisements, banner advertisement, video advertisements, etc. Next, and the final task in this first step in the process of A-B testing is to state the statistical hypothesis based on the business hypothesis and the chosen primary metric. Next, and in the final task in this first step of the A-B testing process, we need to state the statistical hypothesis based on the business hypothesis we stated and the chosen primary metric. In the section of fundamentals to statistics of this course, in lecture number seven, we went into details about statistical hypothesis testing, including what null hypothesis is and what alternative hypothesis is. So do have a look to get all the insights about this topic. A-B testing should always be based on a hypothesis that needs to be tested. This hypothesis is usually set as a result of brainstorming and collaboration of relevant people on the product team and data science team. The idea behind this hypothesis is to decide how to fix a potential issue in a product where a solution of these problems will influence the key performance indicators or the KPI of interest. It's also highly important to make prioritization out of a range of product problems and ideas to test, while you want to pitch that fixing this problem would result in the biggest impact for the product. We can put the hypothesis that is subject to rejection so that we want to reject in the ideal world under the null hypothesis, what we define by H0. While we can put the hypothesis subject to acceptance, so the desired hypothesis that we would like to have as a result of A-B testing under the alternative hypothesis defined by H1. For example, if the KPI of the product is to increase the customer engagement by changing the color of the read more button from blue to green, then under the null hypothesis, 
we can state that click-through rate of learn more button with blue color is equal to the click-through rate of green button. Under the alternative, we can then state that the click-through rate of the learn more button with green color is larger than the click-through of the blue button. So ideally, we want to reject this null hypothesis and we want to accept the alternative hypothesis, which will mean that we can improve the click-through rate, so the engagement of our product, by simply changing the color of the button from blue to green. Once we have set up the business hypothesis, selected the primary metrics, and stated the statistical hypothesis, we are ready to proceed to the next stage in the A-B testing process. In this lecture, we will discuss the next second step in A-B testing process, which is designing the A-B tests, including the power analysis and calculating the minimum sample sizes for the control and experimental groups. Stay tuned as this is a very important part of A-B testing process commonly appearing during the data science interviews. Some argue that A-B testing is an art, and others say that it's a business-adjusted common statistical test. But the borderline is that to properly design this experiment, you need to be disciplined and intentional while keeping in mind that it's not really about testing, but it's about learning. Following are the steps you need to take to have a solid design for your A-B test. So let's bring the diagram back. So in this step, we need to perform the power analysis for our A-B test and calculate the minimum sample size in order to design our A-B test. A-B test design includes three steps. The first step is power analysis, which includes making assumptions about model parameters, including the power of the test, the significance level, etc. The second step is to use these parameters from power analysis to calculate the minimum sample size for the control and experimental groups. And then the final third step is to decide on the test duration depending on several factors. So let's discuss each of these topics one by one. Power analysis for A-B testing includes these three specific steps. The first one is determining the power of the test. This is our first parameter. The power of the statistical test is the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. Power is the probability of making a correct decision, so to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. If you're wondering what is the power of the test, what is this different concepts that we just talked about, what is this null hypothesis, and what does it mean to reject the null hypothesis, then head towards the fundamentals to the statistics section of this course as we discuss this topic in detail as part of that section. The power is often defined by 1 minus beta, which is equal to the probability of not making a type 2 error where type 2 error is the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis, while the null is actually false. It's common practice to pick 80% as the power of the A-B test, which means that we allow 20% of type 2 error. And this means that we are fine with not detecting, so failing to reject the null hypothesis 20% of the time, which means that we are fine with not detecting a true treatment effect while there is an effect, which means that we are failing to reject the null. However, the choice of a value of this parameter depends on the nature of the test and the business constraints. Secondly, we need to determine a significance level for our A-B test. The significance level, which is also the probability of type 1 error, is the likelihood of rejecting the null, hence detecting a treatment effect while the null is actually true and there is no statistically significant impact. This value, often defined by a Greek letter alpha, is the probability of making a false discovery, often referred to as a false positive rate. Generally, we use a significance level of 5%, which indicates that we have 5% risk of concluding that there exists a statistically significant difference between the experimental and control variant performances when there is no actual difference. So we are fine by having 5 out of 100 cases detecting a treatment effect while there is no effect. It also means that you have a significant result difference between the control and the experimental groups within 95% confidence. Like in the case of the power of the test, the choice of the alpha is dependent on the nature of the test and the business constraints that you have. For instance, if running this A-B test is related to high engineering costs, then the business might decide to pick a high alpha, such that it would be easier to detect the treatment effect. On the other hand, if the implementation costs of the proposed version in production are high, you can then pick a lower significance level, since this proposed feature should really have a big impact to justify the high implementation costs. So it should be harder to reject the null hypothesis. 
Finally, as the last step of power analysis, we need to determine a minimum detectable effect for the test. The last parameter as part of the power analysis we need to make assumptions about is what we call minimum detectable effect or delta. From the business point of view, so what is the substantive to the statistical significance that the business wants to see as a minimum impact of the new version to find this variant investment worthy? The answer to this question is, what is the amount of change we aim to observe in a new version's metric compared to the existing one to make recommendations to the business that this feature should be launched in the production, that it's investment worthy? An estimate of this parameter is what is known as a minimum detectable effect, often defined by a Greek letter delta, which is also related to the practical significance of the test. So this MDE, or the minimum detectable effect, is a proxy that relates to the smallest effect that would matter in practice for the business, and it's usually set by stakeholders. As this parameter is highly dependent on the business, there is no common level of it. Instead, so this minimum detectable effect is basically the translation from statistical significance to the practical significance. And here we want to see and we want to answer the question, what is this percentage increase in the performance of the product that we want to experiment with that will tell to the business that this is good enough to invest in this new feature or in this new product. And this can be, for instance, 1% for one product. It can be 5% for another one. And it really depends on the business and what is the underlying KPI. A popular reference to the parameters involved in the power analysis for A-B testing is like this. So 1 minus beta for the power of the test, alpha for the significance level, delta for the minimum detectable effect. To make sure that our results are repeatable, robust, and can be generalized to the entire population, we need to avoid p-hacking, to ensure real statistical significance, and to avoid biased results. So we want to make sure that we collect enough amount of observations and we run the test for a minimum predetermined amount of time. Therefore, before running the test, we need to determine the sample size of the control and experimental groups, as well as later on in this lecture, we will see also how long we need to run the test. So this is another important part of A-B testing, which needs to be done using the defined power of the test, which was the 1 minus beta, the significance level, and a minimum detectable effect. So all the parameters that we decided upon when conducting the power analysis. Calculation of the sample size depends on the underlying primary metric as well that you have chosen for tracking the progress of the control and experimental versions of the product. So we need to distinguish here two cases. So when discussing the primary metric, we saw that there are different ways that we can measure the performance of different type of products. If we are interested in engagement, then we are looking at a metric such as click-through rate, which is in the form of averages. So the case one will be where the primary metric of A-B testing is in the form of a binary variable. It can be, for instance, conversion or no conversion, click or no click, and in case two, where the primary metric of the test is in the form of proportions or averages, which means mean order amount or mean click-through rate, for today, we will be covering only one of these cases, but you can find more details on the second case in my blog, which I posted also as part of the resources section. This blog post contains all the details that you need to know about A-B testing, including the statistical tests and their corresponding hypothesis, the descriptions of different primary metrics that go beyond what we have covered as part of this section, as well as many more details that you need to know about A-B testing. So let's look at a case two where the primary metric of the test is in the form of proportions or averages. So let's say we want to test whether the average click-through rate of control is equal to the average click-through rate of experimental group. And under H0, we have that the mu control is equal to mu experimental. And under H1, we have that the mu control is not to mu experimental. So here, the mu control and mu experimental are simply the average of the primary metric for control group and for the experimental group respectively. So this is the formal hypothesis we want to test with our A-B test. And we can assume that this mu control is, for instance, the click-through rate of the control group, and the mu experimental is the click-through rate of the experimental group. So this is the formal statistical hypothesis we want to test with our A-B test. If you haven't done so, I would highly suggest you to head towards the fundamental statistics section of this course, where in lecture number 7 and 8 of the statistical part of this course, I go in detail about statistical hypothesis testing, the means, averages, significance level, etc. 
This also holds for the theorem that the sum precise calculation is based upon, called central limit theorem. So check out the last lecture about inferential statistics where I cover the central limit theorem, which we will also use in this section. And finally, also check the lecture number five in that section where we cover the normal distribution, another thing that we will use as part of this section. So the central limit theorem states that given a sufficiently large sample size from an arbitrary distribution, the sample mean will be approximately normally distributed, regardless of the shape of the original population distribution. This means that the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normal if we take a large enough sample, even if the distribution of the original sample is not normal. So when we are dealing with a primary performance tracking metric that is in the form of average, such as this one that we are covering today, which is a click-through rate, we intend to compare the means of the control and experimental groups, then we can use the central limit theorem and state that the mean sampling distribution of both control and experimental groups follow normal distribution. Consequently, the sampling distribution of the difference of the means of these two groups also will be normally distributed. So this can be expressed like this, where we see that the mean of the control group and mean of the experimental group follows normal distribution with mean mu control and mu experimental respectively, and then with the variance of sigma control squared and sigma experimental squared respectively. Though derivation of this proof is out of the scope of this course, we can state that the difference between the means of the true group, so x bar control minus x bar experimental, also follows normal distribution, with the mean mu control minus mu experimental, and with the variance of sigma control squared divided to n control, plus sigma experimental squared divided to n experimental, so the sample size of the experimental group and the sample size of the control group. Hence, the sample size needed to compare the means of the two normally distributed samples using a two-sided test with pre-specified significance level alpha, power level, and minimum detectable effect can be calculated as follows. So here you can see the mathematical representation of the minimum sample size. So the n, which stands for the minimum sample size, is equal to, and in the denominator we have sigma control squared plus sigma experimental squared multiplied by z1 minus alpha divided to 2 plus z1 minus beta squared divided to the delta squared. And here, the alpha and the beta and the delta, we have made assumptions about as part of the power analysis. And the sigma control squared and the sigma experimental squared are the uh, estimates of the variance that we can come up with using the so-called AA testing. I would say you do not necessarily need to know this derivation, as there are many online calculators that will ask you for the alpha, the beta, and the delta values, as well as the sample estimates for the sigma squared control and experimental, and then these calculators will automatically calculate the minimum sample size for you. If you are wondering what this AA testing is, and how we can come up with the sigma control squared and sigma experimental squared, as well as all the other values, then make sure to to check out the blog that I posted before and that I mentioned before as I explain in detail all these values, as well as check out the resource section where I've included many resources regarding this. But for now, just keep in mind that the z1 minus alpha divided to 2 and z1 minus beta are just two constants and come from the normal distributed and standard normal distributed tables. I would say you do not necessarily need to know this derivation, as there are many online calculators that will ask you for this alpha, beta, and delta values, as well as the sample estimates for the sigma squared control and sigma experimental control, and then will calculate automatically the sample size for you for the control and experimental group effectively. One example of such calculator is this A-B test online calculator, but if you Google it, you will find many others that will ask you for the minimum detectable effect, for the statistical significance or the statistical power, and then it will automatically calculate for you the minimum sample size that you should have in order to have a statistical significance and in order to have a valid A-B test. One thing to keep in mind is that you will notice that the statistical significance level is set to 95% in here, which is not what we have seen when we were discussing the alpha or significance level. So sometimes these online calculators will confuse or will interchangeably use the significance level versus the confidence level, which are the opposite. So the significance level is usually at the level of 5% or 1%. Confidence level is around 95%, so which is basically 100% minus the alpha. Therefore, whenever you see this 95%, know that this means that your alpha should be 5%. So it's really important to understand how to use this calculator, not to end up with the wrong minimum sample size, conduct an entire A-B test, and then at the end realize that you have used the wrong uh, significance level. 
The final step is to calculate the test duration. This question needs to be answered before you run your experiment and not during the experiment. Sometimes people stop the test when they detect statistical significance, which is what we call p-hacking, and that's absolutely not what you want to do. To, de to determine the baseline of the duration time, a common approach is to use this formula. As you can see, duration is equal to n divided to the number of visitors per day, where n is your minimum sample size that we just calculated in the previous step. And the number of visitors per day is the average number of visitors that you expect to see as part of your experiment. For instance, if this formula results in 14 days or 14, this suggests that running the test for two weeks is a good idea. However, it's highly important to take many business-specific aspects into account when choosing the time to run the test and for how long you need to run it. And simply using this formula is not enough. For example, if you want to run an experiment at the end of the month December with Christmas breaks, when higher than expected or lower than expected number of people are usually checking your web page, then this external and uncertain event had an impact on the page usage. For some businesses, this means uh -huh. For example, if you want to run an experiment at the end of the month of December with Christmas breaks, when higher than expected or in some cases lower than expected number of people are usually checking the web page, so depending on the nature of your business or the product, then this external and uncertain event can have an impact on the page usage for some businesses, which means that for some businesses, a high increase in the page usage can be the result, and for some, a huge decrease in usability. In this case, running A-B tests without taking into account this external factor would result in inaccurate results, since the activity period would not be a true representation of a common page usage, and we no longer have this randomness which is a crucial part of A-B testing. Besides this, when selecting a specific test duration, there are a few other things to be aware of. Firstly, too small test duration might result in what we call novelty effects. Users tend to react quickly and positively to all types of changes independent of their nature. So it's referred as a novelty effect and it varies off in time and is just considered illusionary. So it would be wrong to describe this effect to the experimental version itself and to expect that it will continue to persist after the novelty effect wears off. Hence, when picking a test duration, we need to make sure that we do not run the test for a too short amount of time period, otherwise we can have a novelty effect. Novelty effect can be a major threat to the external validity of an A-B test, so it's important to avoid it as much as possible. Secondly, if the test duration is too large, then we can have what we call maturation effects. When planning an A-B test, it's usually useful to consider a longer test duration for allowing users to get used to a new feature or product. In this way, one will be able to observe the real treatment effect by giving more time to returning users to cool down from an initial positive reaction or a spike of interest due to a change that was introduced as part of a treatment. This should help to avoid novelty effect and this better predictive value for the test outcome. However, the longer the test period, the larger is the likelihood of external effects impacting the reaction of the users and possibly contaminating the test results. This is what we call maturation effect. And therefore, running the AP test for too short amount of time or too long amount of time is not recommended. As this is a very involved topic, we can talk for hours about this part of the A-B test, and also a topic that is asked a lot during the data science and product scientist interviews. Therefore, I highly suggest you to check out this blog about A-B testing, which is a hands-on tutorial about everything you need to know about A-B testing, as well as check out the interview preparation guide in this section that contains 30 most popular A-B testing related questions you can expect during your data science interviews. So stay tuned, and in the next couple of lectures, we will cover the next stages of A-B testing process. If you are looking for one place to learn everything about A-B testing without unnecessary difficulties, but also with a good statistical and data science background, then make sure to check out the A-B testing course at lunatech.ai. So if you want to learn all this background information, including what is statistical significance, what is A-B testing, how can A-B testing be done, and you want to have this end-to-end A-B testing course, then make sure to check the A-B testing for data science course at lunatech.ai.
That's the only course that is available at the moment on the internet that covers the most fundamental concepts of A-B testing, including the theory and the implementation in Python, without no the extra details and right going straight to the point in order to help you to kickstart your journey with A-B testing. The resource that I would suggest you to keep by the hand is the blog called Complete Guide to A-B Testing, Design, Implementation and Pitfalls, which is part of the hands-on tutorials of the Towards Data Science. So in here, and specifically this part where we are discussing the two sample Z tests, I would suggest you to go through it as we are going to conduct this uh, two sample Z test as part of our Python, and we are going to learn how to implement this in Python. In this book, you can learn everything out there that you need to know about A-B testing, including different uh, pitfalls include of A-B testing, the process behind it, how you can conduct the A-B tests uh, end-to-end, how you can calculate the sample size, how you can choose a test, the primary metric definitions, different uh, statistical tests that you can use, including the chi-square test, the two sample Z test, and two sample T test. So given that as part of the lectures of the um, A-B testing and specifically lecture number five, we have already discussed the two sample T test and how to implement it. I thought it would be more useful for you to know how to implement the two sample Z test, such that you know both of them and you know their theory behind it and also how to implement them. And finally, if you are wondering how you can implement them in Python, then head towards my uh, blog uh, in the Medium as well as my GitHub repository that I will post in the resource section, where you can find all the different statistical tests you can use for analyzing your A-B test results, including the two sample T tests, two sample Z tests, chi-square tests, and much more. So without further ado, let's get started with our demo. So uh, as you can see here, I'm generating the data myself, assuming that uh, the uh, primary metric follows binomial distribution. So the output is in the form of a zeros and ones because we are looking into the click event and click can be either zero or one. And then I'm using here the uh, binomial distribution to randomly sample from it. And in case of the experimental version, I'm using a probability of success equal to 0 0.4. And in case of the control version, I'm using a probability of success equal to 0 0.2 because I want to have a quite difference between the two groups. And then later on, we can also adjust this and we can change the uh, difference to see how our test behaves. So um, I'll assume that um, the uh, at the end of the uh, data generation process, we have a data that is similar to the form that you will get from the uh, engineers once they uh, finish up uh, collecting all the data from your customers. And I will also assume that the integrity of the A-B test is held, which means that the observations who were in the control group, they only saw the control version of the product and observations who were in the experimental group, they only saw the experimental version of the product. And let's actually go ahead and see how the data looks like. So as you can see here, we are generating our data. So the data is in this format. So you can see that we have an observation. In total, we have 20K observations because we have two different groups, each with 10K observations. And then the first column describes the click event. So we will either have a click or we will have no click. And the primary metric is in the form of a click. So we are measuring the performance of the product, both control and the experimental, with the same metric, which is whether there is a click event or no click event. And the primary metric is in the form of a binary variable. So we have either zeros or we have ones. Whenever there is a click, then the corresponding value is one. Whenever there is no click, then the corresponding value is zero. And then we have the corresponding group, which helps us to understand whether the observation belongs to the experimental group, so X, or the control group, which is a um, uh, CON. So uh, this is how the data looks like. And it's also what you can uh, expect uh, from uh, data engineers uh, once the uh, A-B test is conducted. So you have run your A-B test and engineers have collected the data, assuming that the data integrity has been kept and also uh, that there was no systematic error when collecting and measuring the performance of the uh, control and the experimental versions of the product. First thing that we are going to do is to estimate the uh, p hat control and a p hat experimental. And for that, what we need to do first is to count the number of clicks per group. So we saw earlier that we have this data that we generate ourselves consisting of 20 k rows, where 10 belongs to the uh, control group and the 10k belongs to the experimental group. And each consists of this click variable and the group. 
the click variable is an indicator uh, that says that the observation clicked on the uh, page versus uh, not clicked on the page. So whenever there was a click, we have here one. Whenever there was no click, we have here zero. And then we have the corresponding uh, group such that we can use to group this data based on the control versus experimental group. And that's exactly what we are going to do as the first step in our process. So we are going to calculate the number of total clicks for control group and for the experimental group. So here we are making use of the function group by in order to group this data frame. So this data frame based on a group, and then we want to click uh, the we want to get the uh, click variable. And we want to sum this variable. Because the uh, variable is of a binary nature, so we have ones and zeros, if we do the sum, we are basically counting the number of times we have the uh, observation a click equal to one. So by summing a binary variable, we are simply getting the number of ones in that variable. And that's exactly what we are doing in this part. And then what is remaining? is to get the uh, number of clicks from control group and number of clicks from the experimental group by using this function called look. So we saw earlier when we were discussing the um, accessing of observations in a pandas data frame that there is a difference between ILOC and LOC. And the reason why we are using here the LOC is because the uh, group uh, data that we are getting in here it will provide us an output where the index is in the uh, format of a string. So let's actually go ahead and uh, print that part because I think it's an important part to see how the data looks like. And it also will make sense why I'm using here the look function to access the uh, control group's number of clicks and the experimental group's number of clicks. So this is the uh, group data frame that we are getting. As you can see, we are getting here the group, and here we are getting for the control uh, index, the number of clicks is equal to 1,924, and for the experimental group, it's equal to 5,017. So then the next thing what we need to do is actually access this volume. And for that, we need to specify that we want to access the volume corresponding to the index equal to control. And this can be done by using this log function. So you cannot use ILOG or any other way of accessing this because the index is of string type. And therefore, we are using the log. So let's actually also add some print statements to make our code more readable. So this will then print the number of clicks per control group and per experimental group. Here we go. So as you can see, we are nicely accessing the correct values. Then the next step is to calculate the p hat control and the p hat experimental. So basically the estimate of the click probabilities of the control group and the experimental group respectively. And for that we just need to take the uh, number of clicks and we need to divide it to the number of observations for that group. So it is this part. Let's go ahead and calculate those values. So as you can see, I'm taking the number of clicks that we just obtained, and I'm dividing it to the number of observations that we have defined in the very beginning. Here we go. So as you can see, for the control group, the uh, click probability is equal to 0 0.20. And in case of the experimental group, it's equal to 0 0.5. So we see that uh, there is a large difference between the click probability for these two groups, which is um, a reflection of what we saw here, because we generated the data such that the uh, success probability for the experimental group is equal to 0 0.5, and the um, for the control group is equal to 0 0.2. So we see these numbers reflecting also in here. And the reason for that is because we have sampled our data large enough, and we see that the um, uh, probability, so the the mean of our sample, um, converges in uh, probability to the mean that we use. And this is also the idea behind the law of large numbers, something that we have also discussed as part of the fundamentals to statistics section of this course. So the next thing what we need to do is to compute the p pooled hat or the uh, estimate of the pooled uh, success probability. 
And we saw uh, when we were discussing the theory behind it that it's equal to the sum of the uh, cliques for both control and experimental group divided to the total number of observations in both control and the experimental group. So basically, the p pooled head is equal to x underscore control plus x underscore experimental divided to the n underscore control plus n underscore experimental. Then the next thing we need to do is to compute the pooled variance. And we just saw that the pooled variance can be calculated by taking the pooled uh, estimate for the click probability, so this p uh, pooled, and then multiplied by 1 minus p pooled head, and then multiplied by the inverses of the uh, observa number of observations in each of the groups and their sum. So 1 divided to n control plus 1 divided to n experimental. So it can be calculated as follows. So pooled variance then is equal to p pooled head multiplied by 1 minus p pooled head multiplied by 1 divided to n control plus 1 divided to n experimental. Let's also add some print statements. Here we go. And then the next step is to calculate the standard error. So the standard error is the square root of the pooled variance. So quite straightforward. And here we are going to make use of the numpy function. So the SE is equal to numpy dot. And a square root is simply uh, calculated by using the function SQRT, which stands for square root. And then here we need to mention the pooled variance. Let's also add the print statement explaining the, uh, the code. And this really can help your reviewer, the code reviewer, to understand what you are doing. Okay, so now we have also the standard error. And now we are ready to calculate our test statistics. So we saw that the test statistics is equal to the uh, p control head minus p experimental head divided to the standard error. And that's exactly what we are going to implement in here. So as you can see, the test statistics is equal to p control head minus p experimental head divided to the SC, so the standard error. And then finally, what we need to do is to compute the z critical value, the p value, and the confidence interval. But for doing that, we need to assume the significance level. So usually this is done before conducting the test, but here I'm assuming that before conducting the test, there was a power analysis, and as part of that, we have decided that the statistical significance level is equal to 5%. So let's add that here. So alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Therefore, we are going to use this specific alpha, so 5%, in order to calculate our critical value coming from the normal table. And to do this, there are uh, various options. So one way of doing that is to hard code the volume, which I would not recommend, but it is definitely uh, an easy way to go if you um, haven't used uh, the Python libraries uh, to automize this process. But here I will provide you the code and I will also tell you how you can use the uh, SciPy's norm um, function in order to calculate the critical volume. And I think keeping the code as general as possible will help you in the long term too, because it can be that this time you're calculating the critical value corresponding to alpha is equal to 0 0.05, but maybe next time you want to calculate the uh, critical value when your alpha is equal to 1%. So you're interested in the uh, case when your type 1 probability is equal to 1%. So for those cases, uh, you want to keep your code as general as possible, such that by changing your uh, variable level, let's say alpha, you don't need to go each time and then in the chat GPT, look for the a corresponding uh, value coming from the standard normal table. So for this, what we are going to use is the norm function. So the norm function come from the SciPy stats library. For that, we need to import from SciPy.stats the norm function, which stands for the normal distribution. So in here, what we need to use is the function called PPF, which is the uh, percentage point function. So the norm done PPF function stands for the percent point function, and it's usually known as the inverse cumulative distribution function or the CDF of the standard normal distribution. And it takes uh, as an input the probability volume, and it returns the corresponding value on the x-axis of the CDF. So, uh, once you provide a p, so here we are providing the p, which is equal to 1 minus alpha divided to 2, then uh, this function calculates the x, so the x-axis, such that the probability of observing a value less than or equal to 2 
or 2x in standard normal distribution is equal to p. So we have this uh, inverse CDF, and we have the x-axis and we have the y-axis. On the y-axis, we have the probabilities, and on the x-axis, we have the x values. So here, what we are basically doing is that we are providing the probability that we have, which is equal to 1 minus alpha divided to 2, and we want to know the corresponding x volume. Therefore, it's also called inverse cumulative distribution function. And in this way, we can calculate a Z critical value, which can help us to identify the place where we need to have our rejection region. And uh, so here is the uh, rejection region of this test. And as you can see, we have a two-sided test. Therefore, we have also uh, two regions. And whenever the um, test statistics is larger than the critical value in the right-hand side, and it is smaller than the critical value from the left-hand side, then we are saying that uh, we can reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, it's also called the uh, rejection region. So uh, once we calculate the set critical volume, we are ready to go to the next step. But before that, let's also add some statement, print statement for readability in here. So the next step is to calculate a p-volume. And a p-volume can be calculated by using the norm.sf function. So the norm function comes once again from the SciPy uh, stats library, and the sf stands for survival function. The norm.sf function stands for a survival function, and it stands for the complement of the CDF function, so the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal distribution. It calculates the probability of observing a value greater than a given threshold. So in this case, we want to calculate the uh, probability that our test statistics will be smaller than equal to the critical volume. And as we saw that the standard normal uh, distribution was symmetric, here we are multiplying just one side of that probability by two in order to obtain our final volume. So here, once we run this test, we will finally get our p-volume. And as you can see here, the p-value of the two sample z tests that we got is equal to zero. Well, now once we have the p-value and also we know what is our alpha, we are ready to test for the statistical significance of our results. So given that our p-value is equal to zero and it's smaller than 0 0.05, so our alpha, we can state that the null hypothesis can be rejected. And we can state that there is a statistically significant difference between our experimental version of the product and the control version of the product. So this will help us to uh, test for the statistical significance of our A-B test. However, if you were, for instance, to have a different sample, so let's say we would compute, uh, we would randomly sample uh, from the binomial distribution. So as you can see, once we are getting the uh, probability of the success the same for the two groups, then the p-value becomes large, at least much larger than the alpha, which means that we can no longer reject the null hypothesis and we can no longer state that there is a statistical evidence at a 5% statistical level that the control version is statistically significantly different from the experimental version. And this uh, verifies that everything that we have done here is correct. So the A-B test results analysis is accurate. Now the question is whether we um, also have a practical significance uh, once we pass the statistical significance test. So let's move this back to what we had before. So this is 0 0.5. And once again, the p-value is just 0. And let's go ahead and calculate our confidence interval such that we can test for the practical significance, and we can comment on the accuracy of the test and the generalizability of our A-B test. So we saw that the confidence interval can be calculated as follows. So we have the difference between the p hat experimental and the p hat control. And then for the lower bound, we need to uh, subtract from this the standard error multiplied by z critical value. And then for the upper bound, we need to do the same only with summing the standard error multiplied by z critical volume. So the difference here, you might notice, is this round function. And the reason why I'm adding this is because I want to have nice numbers that will be rounded, uh, just three numbers after the decimal, instead of having the long uh, floating numbers. So once we go ahead and print this confidence interval, we can also see the lower bound and the upper bound in numbers. Here we go. So as you can see, we are getting a confidence interval, which is quite narrow. So this is a suggestion that our A-B test results are most likely accurate and that the precision of our A-B test is high. And this is a good sign because then we can say that the A-B test we have conducted in here is most likely generalizable to the entire population.
Then the next question is, okay, do we have a practical significance or not? And for that, we do need the final assumption regarding the minimum detectable effect. So let's say during the power analysis before conducting our A-B test, we got an MDE, which, or let's actually call it delta. Let's keep the Greek letters. Uh, and the delta, let's say, is equal to uh, 3%, so 0 0.03. Well, in this case, we can notice that the delta 0 0.03, so 3%, is much lower than the lower bound of our confidence interval, which is equal to 30%, so 29.7%. This means that in that case, we would have said that there is a practical significance also. But if the uh, delta would have been, for instance, the uh, 0 0.31, so we have a 31% delta, then in that case, the uh, delta is no longer smaller than the lower bound of our confidence interval. And in that case, we cannot say that our results are also practically significant. So depending on the business and depending on the assumption regarding the delta or the minimum detectable effect, we can then uh, compare this to the lower bound of the confidence interval, and we can state whether there is a practical significance or not. In case there is a practical significance, then we are good to go. So we can say that we have a statistical significance, we have a practical significance, and we also have a narrow confidence interval, which is a suggestion that our uh, results are also generalizable and accurate. So uh, this completes our uh, A-B test results analysis. And this is all that you need to do in order to have a valid and uh, good quality A-B test. Looking to elevate your data science or data analytics portfolio? then you are in the right place. With this A-B testing and to end case study, you can showcase your A-B testing and coding skills in one place. I'm Tathe Vaslayan, data scientist and AI professional, and I'm the co-founder of Lunar Tech, where we are making data science and AI accessible to everyone, individuals, businesses, and institutions. In this case study, we are going to complete an end-to-end -end case study with A-B testing where we are going to test in a data-driven way whether it's worth to change one of our features in our UX design in the Lunar Text landing page. This is a real-life data science case study that you can conduct and you can put it on your resume in order to showcase your experience in data-driven decision-making, where you will showcase your statistical skills, experimentation skills with A-B testing, and your coding skills in Python using libraries such as test models, but also the uh, pandas, numpy, also matplotlib, and seaburn. We are going to start with the uh, business objective of this case study. Then we are going to translate the business objective into a data science problem. Then we are going to start with the actual coding. We are going to load libraries, we are going to look into the data, visualize the data, the click data, we are going to look into the motivation behind choosing that specific primary metric, which is a click-through rate. Then we are going to talk about the statistical hypothesis for our A-B testing. I will also teach you step-by-step -step all the calculations, starting from the calculation of the pooled estimate from the click-through rate, and then a, a computation of the uh, pooled variance, the standard error, but also the motivation behind choosing the search of statistical tests that I will be using, such as the two sample Z test, and then how you can calculate the test statistics, how you can calculate the p-value of this test statistics, and then use that with the statistical significance to test the uh, statistical significance of your A-B test. After this, we will also then compute the confidence interval, comment on the generalizability of the A-B test, and then at the end, we will also test for the practical significance of the A-B test. Then we will conclude and we will wrap up and we will make a decision based on our data-driven approach using the A-B test to check whether it's worth it to change a feature in our UX design in the Lunar Text landing page. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's now start our case study. In here, I have in the left-hand side this uh, version of our um, landing page, so the, which is our control version, so to say the existing version, where you can see that here we have start free trial. And here we got as our button secure free trial. In the right-hand side, we got this new experimental version that we would like to have, which is the enroll now button. So as we saw in the introduction, what we are trying to understand is that 
or whether our customers click more on the new version, the experimental version versus the existing version, the control version. So um, as of the day of uh, loading this and uh, conducting this case study, our landing page uh, has a secure free trial. But what we want you to test with our data is whether um, the uh, enroll now is more engaging such that we can go from the secure free trial version to the enroll now version. And uh, here, um, for this specific case, uh, not only, but also in general, as we know from A-B testing, is that whenever we got an existing algorithm or existing feature, existing button, then we are referring this group that we will, um, where we will expose this existing version of the product, we are referring this as a control group. So all the users to whom we will show the existing version of our landing page, we will refer them as the uh, control group participants. And then we have the, in the right hand side, our um, experimental version and our experimental users. So the users, our existing customers that are selected to be taken part um, in our experimental group and in our experiment, they will be then uh, exposed to this new version of our landing page, which contains this enroll now button. So our end goal in terms of the business, as we saw in the introduction, is to understand whether we should release the new button, which will end up being higher engaging, which means that we will have higher CTR or higher, uh, more uh, clicks that will come from our user side, which uh, automatically means better business because we want to have highly engaging users. If they are clicking on this button, it means that it interests them more compared to the control version. And uh, if something on our landing page, in this case, our uh, call to action is more interesting and highly engaging, it means that we are doing something right and our users might uh, either make use of our free products or uh, purchase our products or um, just stay engaged with us to keep Lunar Tech in mind. And whenever there is someone who uh, is interested in data science or AI um, solutions or products, then they can at least refer their friends if they are just clicking to understand and to learn more about our products. That's also a possibility. So from a business perspective, we therefore are using here as our primary metric uh, our click-through rate, the CTR of this specific button, which in our control version is the secure free trial and in our experimental version is the enroll now. And what we want to understand is that whether this new button will end up having higher CTR or not, because higher CTR from the technical perspective will translate to higher engagement from the business perspective. So here we are making this translation from business versus technical. Um, when it comes to A-B testing, we can have different sorts of primary metrics. We can have a click-through rate as a primary metric. We can have a conversion rate as a primary metric or any other primary metric. What we want to have as our metric that will work the, as the single measure that will compare our control and experimental group to understand which version performs better is first to understand what this definition of better is and how that translates back to the business. Because if the engagement is what we are referring as better business for some reason, and I will explain you in a bit why we think the engagement in this case is what we what matter for us at Lunar Tech then it means that click-through rate can be used as a primary metric. This is just a universal metric that has been used across um, different web applications, search engines, recommender systems, and many other digital products to understand whether the engagement of that specific algorithm, feature, web design, whether that is better or not. And in this case, in this specific case study, we are also going to use the CTR because we are interested in the engagement. So at Lunar Tech, we really care about the engagement um, with our users. And we want our users to make use of our products, but uh, ultimately to engage with us. Because if they engage with us, it means that our products are being seen, our, um, our landing page is being visited, and the user is actually interested to click on that button and then the action point, and then to start either a free trial 
or to enroll to see what is going on because all these are signs of interest coming from the user side. And in the control version, as our click to action is to secure a free trial, which directly uh, lends the user to our free trial to our ultimate data science bootcamp. But given that we are expanding, which means that we are now offering more courses, we are offering free products, and also we have uh, enterprise clients, uh, we have businesses as clients who want data science and AI solutions and who want corporate training. Therefore, we want to go from this niche uh, version of a landing page, so secure free trial, to enroll now, because we already have a lot of engagement in terms of the free trial. We want to make it more general. So that's the business perspective. And on the other hand, we also want to change, beside of changing this um, main um, call action, we want to make it generalized. And at the same time, we want to see whether this generalized version will end up leading us um, a higher engagement, not only in terms of the other products, but also for the free trial, free trial itself. Because we always are looking for educating people and providing these free trials such that they can make use of our flagship product, which is the, the ultimate data science bootcamp. So now when we understand why we care about the engagement here at LearnerTech, and we understand why we want to check whether this new button in our UX design will end up increasing the engagement or not, we can now make this translation back to the data science terms. Because we know now from the business perspective, all we care is to understand whether this experimental version of the product is performing better or not. But then this means that we need to conduct an A-B test and we need to understand whether and the ideas that we got and the speculation that the enroll now more general button as a call to action will be better than the secure free trial version, whether this is actually true or not from the uh, customer's perspective. Because if we want to call us a data-driven company, we cannot just base our conclusions and our decisions for our products or for just in general for our product roadmap based on intuition or logic. We want this to be data-driven, which means that the customers are at the first place. We are customer-driven and our customers need to tell us whether the new um, button is better or not. And here we have conducted an, conducted an A-B test and um, here I won't be using the real data. I will be using the uh, proxy data or simulated data that I uh, generated myself. And um, this one contains the similar structure and this, uh, the same um, idea of the data that we got when we were uh, conducting our A-B test and collecting this data. And what is our business uh, hypothesis? In our business hypothesis, we can say that we have at least 10% increase in our click-through rate, so 10% higher engagement, when we have our enroll now versus the secure free trial uh, version of the product. So this is our business hypothesis, which means that our enroll now CTR, so click-through rate of the enroll now button, will result in at least 10% higher CTR than the secure free trial. So there exists a 10%, at least 10% difference in terms of the engagement when we compare this new version of the product versus the old version of this uh, new uh, button. And when we translate this back to a statistical hypothesis, we can say that under the null hypothesis, we are saying that there is no statistically significant difference between the um, control P and then P experimental, which means the um, um, a probability, click-through probability, click-through rate for control group versus experimental group. So under H null, the null hypothesis, we are stating what we ideally want to reject. We are saying there is no difference between the experimental and control group CTR. And under the alternative hypothesis, so the H1, we are saying no, uh, we do have a difference, which means that the uh, control groups a CTR is different from the control, uh, experimentals group CTR. And one key part here is to mention that they are not just different, but they are statistically significantly different. So uh, when it comes to starting the case study, first things first is to load the libraries. In this case study, we are going to use a NumPy. We are going to use a pandas as usual for any sorts of data analytics, data science, um, case studies. You always need those two usually. 
Pandas will be needed for our um, data wrangling to load the data, process the data, visualize it. NumPy will be used to uh, work with different arrays and part of the data. Then we are going to use the scipy.stats uh, model, and from that we will import the norm function. Later on, um, we will see that we are using this in order to visualize this um, uh, rejection region that we get from uh, for our test to understand whether we need to reject our null hypothesis or not. And then, in this case study, we also want to visualize our results and visualize our data for which we are going to need our visualization libraries from Python, which are the Seaburn and the Metplotly. Let's look into our data. So what we have in our data, we have four different columns. And of course, this is a filtered data that contains the information that we need. But in general, you can have a larger database, you can have more sorts of um, um, matrix, matrices and uh, different other metrics. But for conducting your A-B test, the pure A-B test, you actually need only the following information. So you need your user ID to understand uh, what are the user you are dealing with. So it's the user 1, user 2, user 10. It can be that you have other way of referring to your users. And uh, those can be, for instance, these long strings that we use to refer to our user. But given that our um, case is a simple one, our case study, we have just a user ID and this user ID is just uh, integers that go from one till uh, until the end of our um, uh, data. And here we got in total 20,000 users. Therefore, this number user ID goes to uh, 20,000. And those 20,000 um, are all part of the user group, which means that they are all users and they contain both the experimental and control users. Then we have our um, uh, click variable. And this click variable, it's a binary variable, which can be uh, either one or zero, where one refers that the user has clicked on the button and zero means the user didn't click on the button. This is our primary metric for our A-B test. Then we have the group reference, which is this um, string variable. And this string variable helps us to understand whether the user comes from the experimental group or from the control group. So this can contain only two different values, two strings. And it is exp referring to the experimental and control referring to the uh, control group. If you can see here, we got just these three letters, exp referring to the experimental group. And then if we go in here, because we have first the experimental and then the control ones, you can see that here we got the uh, control group. Then we have also some timestamp, which is uh, not something relevant. So we'll be skipping that for now. Um, given that this uh, data that we have here, it's not the actual data, our data, but it's a synthetic one, but similar in terms of its structures, in terms of the uh, nature of variables. And you can implement exactly the same steps when you have your data and you are getting it from your A-B test, and then you are conducting your A-B test uh, case study. So in here, what we are going to make use of the most is our click variable and the group variable, because we want to find out per group, what are the users that have clicked on the uh, button. And to be more specific, we are looking for these averages. So we are not so much interested that that specific user from that specific group has clicked on the product or not. That's something that we can explore later. But for now, we are interested on the more high level. So what is this uh, percentages? What is the click probability or click through rate per group? And here we got groups of experimental and control as it should be in any source of A-B test. So once we have conducted our A-B test, then I will also provide you more insights on what you can do with your data, especially with this user ID, to learn more about uh, the idea behind these different decisions or whether your A-B test is different per group. But the idea is that this A-B test that we are conducting by following all these steps and by ensuring that the uh, pitfalls are avoided, that we are making a decision that um, represents the entire population. So we are using a sample that is large enough for us to make a decision 
for our product and for our business that will be generalized and will be a representation and representative when we apply this decision on our population. So let me close this part because we no longer need this. And let's go ahead and load this data. So here I'm using the pandas library and the common uh, abbreviation of PD. And I'm saying pd.read underscore CSV. And then I'm here referring to the name of the data that contains my click data. And here you can see that data, that data is here. So ab underscore test underscore click underscore data dot CSV. And I will be providing you this data because you won't have this in your own Google Collab. You will have the link to this Google Collab. And I'll provide you also the data such that you can put that data, you can download it first from my source and then load it in here by using this specific button in here. And by doing that, you can then go to that specific folder where you downloaded the data, and then you will have also this uh, corresponding CSV file in your folders. So once you have that, then you will uh, smoothly run this code. And uh, here I'm loading that data and putting under the name of DF underscore AB underscore test. So basically the data frame containing my AB test click data. What I want you to do is to showcase you how the data looks like. So here you will see the header, given that here I haven't provided any argument, it just uh, looks at the top five elements, so the top five rows. And here I got only the first five users from the experimental group. I see that some of them have clicked, some of them didn't click, and the corresponding user ID and the timestamp uh, that they um, done the click action. Then um, when we look at the describe function, you can see here that this gives us more general idea uh, of uh, what the data contains. Not so much what the top five rows just look like, which is great in terms of to understand what kind of data you are dealing with, with what kind of variable you have. Now you can see more the uh, total uh, picture. So high level picture, what kind of um, data, what amount of data you got. So the descriptive statistics. So here we can see that in total, we got 20,000 of users included in this data. So 20,000 observations and 20K rows. And then we have the mean for the user ID, of course, it, it's not relevant. The mean is 10,000. And um, this is an interesting number. So we see that the um, average click, uh, when we look at both user and control, uh, the experimental and control groups, it is 40%, so 0 0.40.52. So 40.52%. However, this is not what we are too much interested. So this is not to be confused with the click-through rate pair group. What we are interested in is the click-through rate or the mean click-through um, when it comes to the experimental group and the control group. So then we have our um, standard deviation. We see a high standard deviation, which is understandable given that we have this uh, large variation in our data. We got a control group and experimental group, and this variation shows that we have a huge difference in, the, in these different values uh, when it comes to the click event. And then we have the mean and the maximum, which doesn't give us too much information because the click event, uh, so the click variable is a binary variable. It contains the zeros and ones. So naturally, the minimum will be the value zero because the click can take value zero and one. And the largest one is, of course, one, which means the maximum would be one. And then for the rest, the 25%, so the first quantile, the second quantile, the 15%, which is also the median, or the third quantile, the 75th percentile, is not that much relevant. So when it comes to the descriptive statistics for this kind of data, especially if it's filtered, it's not super relevant. But if you would have a larger data, more matrices, beside of click, which is your primary metric, but you all have also measures of other metrics, which is recommendable, then you would see more um, values, which would be interesting to look at. So not only to look at the click rate, but also to look at, for instance, the mean or maybe the median of conversion rate or the uh, mean uh, amount of time, the average amount of time the user has spent on your landing page or how much time did that user end up spending before making that decision of a click 
those can be all very interesting matrix to look into from the product uh, data science perspective to understand the decision process and the channel and the funnel of these clicks. But for now, for our case study, what we are purely interested is in our primary metric, which is the click event. So what we can also see in here is that we got um, uh, in our group, um, when it comes to the control group, we got uh, 1,989 users out of all uh, control users that end up clicking versus the experimental group where we have 6,116 users who did click. So do not confuse this with the uh, total amount of users per group. This amount is the um, grouping of the uh, data. So using the group by and then group. So we are grouping that data per group and we want to see per group what is the sum of this variable, sum of the clicks? And given that the click is a binary variable, we know from basics of Python that we are basically accounting the number of click events. Because if you got a binary variable containing zeros and ones, if you do the sum of the clicks, adding the zeros do not ha doesn't have any impact, which means that um, you end up just summing up all the ones to each other, and then you end up getting the number of or the total amount of uh, cases when this click variable is equal to one. So in this case, when there is a click event. Therefore, we can see that per experimental group, um, we got 6,116 uh, users out of all the experimental users that end up clicking. And then out of control group, this amount is much lower. So we end up having uh, only 989 users clicking. So let's now go ahead and visualize this data. I want to showcase in a bar chart using these clicks, what is the total number of clicks? So I want to show the distribution of the clicks when it comes to um, the uh, click event per group. And here I want to uh, see next to each other the experimental group and control group. And as you can see here, here we are getting our bar charts and the yellow corresponds to the no, which means that there was no click versus the uh, black corresponds to the yes, which means there was a click. So whenever you see this amount, it means that that amount uh, corresponds to no click, no engagement from the user side. And this is per group. So this is what we are referring as a click distribution in our uh, data, in our experimental uh, and control groups. And the way that I generated this bar chart is by first creating this um, uh, list that will contain the colors that I want to assign to each of my groups. And I'm saying zero corresponds to the yellow and one corresponds to black, which means that if my variable contains an amount of zero, in this case, my click is equal to zero, it means that I don't have a click, so it's a no. And this I want to visualize by yellow. Otherwise, I have a black, which means that um, the, um, the one corresponds to the case when we have um, click. And in this case, we will get a black. As you can see here, the uh, yes, which means a click is um, visualized by this black color. And then what I'm doing is that I'm initializing this uh, figure size by saying that I, I want to have a figure size of 10 and 6. You you can also skip it. But I I think it's always great to put the size of a figure to ensure that you are getting the size like you want it to be. Such that later on you can also download or take a screenshot. Then we have this uh, here I'm using, uh, as you can see, a combination of the matplotlib.pyplot library as well as the uh, Seabird because Seaburn has much nicer colors. And here I'm saying uh, we are going to uh, make use of the Seaburn to um, create a um, count plot because we are going to count and we are going to showcase the counts per group, uh, what is the number or the count of the clicks versus no clicks for a group called experimental and what is the number of um, or the percentage of clicks versus no clicks when it comes to the group control. 
And then here I'm specifying that the hue should be on the click, which means that we are looking at the click variable and we are going to use the data DFAB test, which means that we are going to look in this data. From here, we are going to select this specific variable called click and we are going to use this in order to group our data based on this group. So you can see that we are doing the grouping on the variable called group. So the argument is called x, x is equal to group. We are grouping our DFAB test data on this group and we are going to do the count in our count plot based on this variable click. Basically, what I'm saying here is that go and group our data DFAB test based on group, which means that we will group based on experimental versus control. And then I'm saying go and count the click events. Count pair group, so pair experimental, pair control group, what is the number of times when we have a no, so we have a zero, and what is the number of times when we have a yes or we have a one as a value for click variable. And then as a palette, I'm using my custom palette that I just created, which should be in the form of a list as you can see in here. If I would have here also my third group or fourth group, then I of course need to extend this color palette because I need to have the same amount of colors as the number of groups per my target variable. In this case, the click has only two possible values, zero and one, which means that I'm only, only specifying these two colors in my list. So then we have the title of our plot, always nice to add by, and then we have our labels, which means that I want to emphasize uh, as my X label. So here I want to have my group, you can see here is my group because I will either have group experimental or control. That's my variable on my X axis. And on my Y axis, of course, I have the, the count. So I'm counting the number of times I got uh, the uh, no click versus click event. So here note that the um, Y axis is in terms of this count. So here you can see it's... Uh, 8,000 here, 7,000 or 6,000, 5,000, which means that we are talking about the numbers and the counts rather than percentages. And this is important because um, another thing that I'm also doing is that I'm going the extra mile and I'm also adding beside of this counts on the top of each bar, I, I want to visualize and clarify what are the corresponding percentages. It's always great to enhance your data visualization with some percentages. Percentages is easier for the uh, person who follows your presentation to understand. For instance, if you got an experimental group and the, the user says here 6,000 and um, 4,000, they might not quickly understand that you got, for instance, in total 10,000 of users and then 6,000 has then uh, clicked and then 4,000 didn't click. So um, then the idea is that by adding these percentages, we can then see that 61.2% has clicked in this experimental group and 38.8% has not clicked. Of course, this is simulated data. I have specifically picked the extreme in such a way that we can clearly see this difference in the click-through rates. But um, in the reality, you can have a click-through rate of 10% up to 14%, which is usually a good number. If you have a click-through rate of 40%, it's great. But it really depends on underlying user base, what kind of product you got, how large is your user base. Because if you have a very large user base, then 10% can be a good click-through rate. Versus if you have a very small user base, maybe 61% uh, is considered uh, good or average. So... Uh, in here, we have just a simulated data, of course, and I have added these percentages uh, by using the following code. So I won't go too much into detail in here. Um, uh, feel free to check and see, uh, and if something doesn't make sense, go uh, back to our Python for Data Science course that contains a lot of information on the basics in Python. But here, just quickly, what I'm doing is that I am uh, calculating the percentages and I'm annotating the bars. So I want to know what are these percentages, which means that per group, I want to take the total amount of clicks. I want to understand what is the number of click event when the click variable is equal to one. So, and what are the number of cases when there was no click from the user side, which is the, what are the number of cases when the click variable is equal to zero. 
and then I'm counting those amounts and then using the total amount to calculate the percentage. For instance, in this specific case, I'm filtering the data for experimental group. I'm looking at the total number of users for this group, which is 10K, and then I'm counting the number of times when out of this 10,000 users, the amount of users that end up clicking on that button, which is the click is equal to one case, and then I'm taking that number, dividing it to the total number of users for this experimental group, multiplying by 100 in order to get that in percentages. And this is the calculation that you can see in here. One thing that is important here is that here I'm using this um, uh, percentage. Um, so for the current bar, I'm saying uh, as a way to identify whether we are dealing with experimental or control group, is by getting by looking into this uh, P, and uh, this P in here is the basically the patches. So in this case, I'm basically saying if I'm dealing with the experimental group, then go ahead and calculate what is this uh, total amount of observations, and then take what is the uh, number of clicks, and then divide these two numbers, uh, calc uh, multiply this with hundred. And this will then give us the percentage. And then I'm doing this for each of those groups. So I'm doing it for this group, I'm doing for this group, and for this one, and for this one. So I got two groups, but then within each group, I got clicks and no clicks. And I'm calculating these four different percentages. And then I'm adding these percentages on the top of those bars. So I not only want to have numbers represented in my visualizations, but I also want to add these corresponding percentages at the top, just for visualization purposes. I wanted to put this out there because this can help your uh, data visualization toolkit, and it also will um, make your audience from your presentations be more thankful to you when you are telling the story of your data. So. Uh, this is about the data that we have. We see that 38.8% uh, of our experimental group users have not clicked on the button versus the 61.2% have clicked on the button based on the simulated data. And then uh, in the control group, we have a quite the opposite situation. We got the majority of the users, 80.1% not clicking on the button versus the remaining 19.9% have actually clicked on that button. So we got a huge difference, a dissonance when it comes to the experimental group and uh, control group. This kind of gives us an indication, hey, something is going on here. We kind of uh, have already um, high level intuition what the remaining analysis will look like. Um, which is that there most likely will be a difference in their CTRs when it comes to the, uh, the, um, uh, control versus experimental group and the uh, corresponding buttons. But uh, hey, let's continue. That's the entire goal behind A-B testing is to ensure that our intuition, our conclusions are all based on the data rather than on our intuition. So what are the parameters that I'm using here? For conducting our A-B test, when I was designing this A-B test, uh, the first step was to, of course, do all these different translations that we learn as part of our A-B test course, um, conducting it properly, which means coming up with these three different parameters when doing our power analysis. And usually this should be done when you are collaborating also with your colleagues and uh, with your product managers or your product people, domain experts, because they have um, a lot of information on what it means to have a um, threshold that you need to pass in order to say that, for instance, this new version of your feature is different and is uh, considerably uh, different from the existing one. And here, um, in order to for us to understand this uh, and make these conclusions, we need to come up with these three different parameters that can help us to properly conduct an A-B test, as we learned when we were looking into designing a proper A-B test. So first we have our significance level. The significance level, or the alpha, the Greek letter that we are using to refer to the significance level, which is also the probability of the type 1 error, and that amount we have chosen following the industry standard, which is 5%. 
given that we didn't have any uh, previous information or specific reason to choose a different significance level, so lower or higher, we decided to go with the industry standard, which is the 5%. This means that we want to have, um, we want to compare our p-value of our uh, statistical test to this 5% and then say whether we have a statistically significant difference between the control and experimental group based on this 5% significance level. And let's refresh our memory on this alpha. This alpha uh, or significance level is also the probability of type 1 error. So this is the amount of error that we are comfortable making when we um, reject the null hypothesis while the null hypothesis is actually uh, true, which means that we are detecting a difference between the experimental and control version while there is no difference. And we are making that mistake. And here we are saying that we are fine and we are comfortable with making this mistake at a maximum of 5%. But higher than that, it's not allowed. We are not comfortable making uh, error um, higher than 5%. Then the next variable, uh, in this case, the B uh, or beta, the probability of type 2 error, which is the opposite of the type 1 error, which is a false negative rate or the amount of time, the... Um, um, a proportion of time when we end up failing to reject the null hypothesis, while well, null hypothesis is false and it should have been rejected. Then the 1 minus beta is actually power of the test. So what is the amount of time we are correctly rejecting our null hypothesis and correctly stating that there is indeed a statistically significant difference between our experimental group and our control group? So we have chosen for this the uh, industry standard as well, which is the 80%. But given that for your results analysis, in this case, we're conducting this case study, that part of the power analysis is not relevant. We use that when calculating our minimum sample size, but we don't need that when conducting our results analysis. Therefore, I'm not initializing that as part of this code. So here I'm only uh, providing to my program the values for my significance level, which is 0 0.05, or this is the same as 5%. And then the delta, which is the third parameter, and this delta is our minimum detectable effect. So this uh, Greek letter delta, which is the minimum detectable effect, helps us to understand whether beside of having this statistically significant difference, whether this difference is large enough for us to say that we are comfortable making that business decision to launch this new button. So it can be that when we are conducting an A-B test, we are finding out that the experimental group has indeed higher engagement than the uh, control group. And we are uh, getting a small P or at least smaller than the alpha. And we're seeing that P is more than the alpha level, which means that we can reject the null hypothesis and we can say that the uh, CTR or the click-through rate of the experimental group is statistically significantly different from the control group at 5% significance level. But we know from the theory of A-B test that only that is not enough. Only statistical significance is not enough for the business to make that important decision to launch an algorithm or to launch a feature. In this case, to change our landing page, the button from the uh, start free trial to the enroll now. Which means that we want to have enough users and we want to have enough difference, large difference in our click-through rates or enough users saying that we are more happy with this uh, new version of the landing page for us to go and change our feature. And what is the definition of enough? What is the difference in the click-through rate that we need to detect after we have detected the statistical significance in order for us to say that we also have a practical significance. So practically, we are also comfortable making that business decision and then launching this new feature and changing our landing page button. And that is exactly what we have under our delta, this minimum detectable effect. In this case, we have chosen for delta of 10%. So you can see here 0 0.5. This is 10%. This means that our delta or the MDE, the minimum detectable effect, is 10%. This means that we are saying not only we should have a statistically significant difference between the experimental group and control group, but also we need to have this difference 
to be at least 10%, which means that we need to have detected that the experimental version of the landing page results in at least 10% higher click-through rate compared to the control version for us to go ahead and to launch this new version and deploy this new uh, UX uh, feature. So this is really important because many people go and check for statistical significance. So they do their alpha and then check uh, whether the p-value is more the alpha and then say, hey, we have a statistically significant difference. And then they are done with that. But that's not correct. After you have conducted your uh, statistical significant analysis and you have detected that your uh, experimental version has a statistically significant difference um, CTR than the control version at your alpha significance level, the next thing you need to do is to ensure that you also have a practical significance beside of this statistical significance. And this practical significance you can detect and you can check when you use your MDE or your delta and you compare it to your confidence interval that you have calculated. Something that we have also learned as part of the theory of conducting a proper A-B test. But once we come to that point, so after we check for our statistical significance, I will also explain how exactly uh, we will need to do this check. And at the same time, we will also be refreshing our theory on the practical significance. So let's now go ahead and calculate the total number of clicks per group by summing up these clicks. And I also want to calculate and group by this amount just to showcase how you can do that on your own. So here what I'm doing is that I'm taking my A-B test data, I'm grouping by, by group. Group is the uh, variable that contains the reference whether we are dealing with experimental group or control group. And as you know from our uh, Python series and demos, Python for Data Science course, that uh, whenever we want to group that data, a pandas data frame, first we need to say pandas data frame name dot group by within parentheses the variable that we are using to do the grouping, which is in this case group. And then within square braces, I want to emphasize and put the name of a variable that I want to uh, apply operations on. So I want to group my data on the group variable and I want to count the number of times I have a click in my control group and in my experimental group. This will be my X control and X experimental variables. So X control will then compute, contain information about number of clicks in my control group. And then X experimental will contain the number of clicks in my experimental group. And given that uh, I want to refer to the name of that uh, group after I did my grouping, so I am getting this kind of, this shape of data frame. Of course, I then need to uh, use my dot log function in order to properly call that amount. So to understand what is this amount corresponding to this index and what is this amount corresponding to this index. And given that my index is in strings, I'm then using here my dot log function. Something that we also learned as part of our Python for data science course. So here is basically the printing, you know, just writing nicely what are the results, which means that we are counting that the, let me count again, that the uh, number of uh, clicks for my control group is 1,989. So you can see that it is want to double check and see what we got. Yes. So we got the same number. So we are dealing with the same data set just to make sure. And here the number of clicks for our experimental group is equal to 6K and then 116. So 6,116 clicks. So then we are calculating the uh, pooled estimates for the clicks per group. Let me quickly fix this typo. So calculating the uh, pooled estimate for the clicks pair group, which means the pooled estimate for the experimental group and for the uh, control group. So let me quickly add here how I can calculate the uh, total cases when we got uh, experimental group users. So what is the number of users in the experimental group and what is the number of users in the uh, control group? So here what I want to do is that I want to say 
that the group DDF test group should be equal to experimental and this of course should be my filter and I want to count this and let me quickly copy this I saw that it's already under the control so here I'm changing to the control and this will need to give me the number of users in each of these groups too so the number of users in control and number of users in click and here I will simply check this so I will print then the number of users per group and at the same time I will also click the number of clicks per group there we go so now when we have done this what we are ready to do is to go ahead and calculate the pooled estimate for clicks per group which means pair control group and pair experimental group. For that, what we need to do is to take the number of clicks of the control group, divide to the number of all users for control group, as you can see in here, x control divided to n control. And we are referring to this variable as p control hat, because we know that the estimate of this click probability um, is always with a hat. It's just a way that we reference it in um, statistics and in A-B testing. So this is the estimate, something that we are estimating, therefore we are saying hat. And then we have the same for experimental group, which means that the estimate of the experimental groups uh, click probability is equal to x exp and then divided to n exp. Then um, in order to calculate the uh, pooled estimate or the, uh, pooled click probability, which means the value that will describe both the uh, control group and experimental group, we need to follow this formula, which means that we are taking the x control, we are adding to that x control the x experimental. This is our nominator of our uh, value. And then we are dividing this to the uh, sum of the sizes of each of those groups, which is n control and n experimental. So this is the common formula of the pooled estimate uh, when it comes to this type of experimentation, when you are dealing with a um, primary uh, metric that is in the form of zeros and ones. And if you want to refresh your memory on this type of formulas, then make sure to also check our A-B testing course, because in there we go in detail in this uh, specific lesson of the uh, A-B test result, results analysis, we are looking into this uh, all these formulas on how we can calculate the pooled estimate of this uh, click probability. So click probability, but then we are calling it pooled click probability. And then what we got is this volume. So that amount is then 0 0.40. This number should look familiar because this is then the mean that we saw when we were looking at the um, uh, descriptive statistics table. If you can recall this table, let me see this number. So now basically we are then calculating this manually because we need a variable that will hold this uh, volume. So it is simply summing up all the clicks for control group and experimental group to get the total number of clicks. And we're dividing it to the total number of users. So n control plus n experimental. So now when we have this, we are ready to also calculate what we are referring as a pooled variance. Also something that we have learned as part of the theory for A-B testing. So the pooled variance is equal to the pooled estimate of the clicks. So P pooled head, something that we just calculated, multiplied by one minus P pooled head. So the uh, click event, the estimate of the click probability multiplied by the estimate of no click. And we know already this idea of Bernoulli distribution that the variable that uh, describes this process of clicks and no clicks follows kind of this idea of Bernoulli distribution when we have a click and no click. So we have probability of click and then we have a probability of no click, which is the one minus that click probability. So that's the idea or the part of the formula that we are following as kind of an intuition. And then 
this multiplied by 1 divided to n control plus 1 divided to n experimental. So here I'm purely following the formula for the pooled variance. If you want more details and explanations, ensure to check the corresponding theory lecture because we are going into details of each of those formulas and understanding why we calculate this um, pooled variance and pooled estimates uh, in this specific way and using these specific formulas. So here, by just follow, following the uh, formula, I'm getting that the uh, pooled uh, variance is this amount. So this is in a nutshell how I calculated my uh, pooled click probability and the pooled variance of that click event. And we are going to need that in the next very important step, which is calculating the standard error and calculating the test statistics. Because in this case, what we are doing is that we are dealing with a case when the primary metric is in the form of zeros and ones. So we have let's now quickly talk about the uh, choice of a statistical test be uh, before conducting the actual calculation of standard error and the test statistics. So here I went for the two samples that test and let me explain you why and what is the motivation. Because as we learned as part of the theory, um, whenever we have a primary metric that is in the form of an averages, like we have now, because we are using the P control head and P experimental head. So we have a primary metric that is the uh, click through rate, which is the average clicks per group. So we have calculated the average click per experimental group and per control group. Then the primary metric, the form of it already dictates, given that it's in averages, that we need to look at uh, either parametric tests corresponding to these averages or non-parametric tests corresponding to the um, averages. In this case, I went for the parametric case because uh, it has better properties if I have this information about the distribution of my data. And why do I have this information? And then this also dictates the uh, choice of my um, statistical test. Well, I have a size of my sample, which is over 100 and uh, actually over 30. That's the threshold that we tend to use in statistics and in A-B testing in order to say whether we have a large size or large data or not. If our sample is not large, so it contains less than 30 users per group, which happens as well, then we say that we need to go for um, statistical tests uh, that will be specific for this kind of cases because we can no longer make use of the uh, statistical theorems like the central limit theorem, which helps us to um, uh, to take the uh, to uh, the inference, so to make use of the inferential statistics and make conclusions regarding the distribution of our population just having the sample. And what do I mean by that? So if my sample is larger than 30, like in this specific case, I got 10,000 users per group, so it is definitely larger than 30 uh, users. Then in that case, I can say that by making use of the central limit theorem, I can say that my sampling distribution is normally distributed. And this is simply making use of the central limit theorem, something that we have also learned when we were looking into this concept of inferential statistics as part of the fundamentals to statistics course, uh, course um, in Lunar Tech. So this is a powerful theorem that we use in A-B testing in order to make our life easier. Because when we have a sample that is larger than 30 for each of these groups, then we can say that even if we don't know the actual distribution or the name of the distribution that our uh, sample follows when it comes to the click uh, event. So the random variable that describes this uh, number of clicks or the average click-through rate, what is that um, distribution exactly? But given that we have that this uh, size is large enough, it's larger than 30 users, we can say that by making use of the central limit theorem, we can say that the, uh, uh, the uh, sample distribution follows a normal distribution if given that the sample size is large enough. And this helps us to say that, well, in that case, 
It doesn't matter whether we make use of the two sample Z test or two sample T test. We can make use of either of these tests in order to conduct our analysis. And we had this specific template to make this choice easier uh, in our A-B test course at the Lunar Tech, where we were making all these decisions and saying, if the sample size is this, we need to do this. If the sample size is this, we need to do this. And in this specific case, following that exact structured and organized approach, I ended up seeing that my sample size is large. So it's larger than 30. So I can then make use of the central limit theorem. I then know what is the random, um, what my random variable describing this click through rate um, follows the kind of distribution, in this case, a normal distribution. And then this means that whether I use a t-test or z-test doesn't really matter. I'm going to end up with the same conclusions. Therefore, I will just go with the two sample z-test simply because um, it is just easier for me to do, for example. You can also go with the two sample t-test and you can even change this case study and tweak it and then make it your own and put it on your resume in that way by making it more unique. And that will be totally fine because you will see that you are going to end up with exactly the same conclusions as we do in this specific case study. Because if you have a large enough sample, it won't matter whether you have a two sample z-test as your parametric test or the two sample t-test. And um, if you want to know why, why this matters and all these different detailed statistical insights, make sure to check the actual uh, course dedicated to A-B testing because there we cover this all and you will then become a master in the field of A-B testing. Now we know all these uh, decisions and the motivation behind choosing the uh, two sample Z-test. Let's now go ahead and do the actual calculations. So here we have a standard error which we calculate by taking the pooled variance and taking the square root of it. And this is again using the idea of these formulas that we learned as part of the A-B test. So we are using this pooled variance, taking the square root of this, which gives us the standard error. And the standard error, as you can see in here, is then equal to 0 0.00692949, this amount. Then we calculate our test statistic for our two sample Z-test. So the test statistic is equal to P control hat minus P experimental hat divided to standard error. So here uh, you can now see the motivation behind not only computing the P pulled hat, but really also the P uh, control hat and P experimental hat. And then I take the P control hat and subtract the P experimental hat, and I divide it to the standard error to compute my test statistics. Once I did this, as you can see, this is this amount. So test statistics for our two sample Z-test is this amount, minus 59.56 rounded. Then um, we can also compute the critical value of our Z-test, which is uh, by using this norm function that we uh, loaded in here from the SciPy. And this will help us to understand what is this value from our normal distribution table, the standard normal distribution table, uh, where by making use of this table, we identify uh, what is this critical value that we need to have to uh, create our rejection regions and to say whether we can uh, reject our null hypothesis or not. So to conduct our test, we need to have a critical value for, uh, to which we will compare our test statistics. And this critical value will be based simply on the standard normal distribution. So this is this norm.ppf. And then uh, probability um, uh, function, basically. Uh, the, uh, the probability function that comes from the normal distribution, standard normal distribution. And as you can see, this corresponds specifically to this percent point function, which is the inverse of the cumulative distribution function. So this based on the alpha divided 2. So 1 minus alpha divided 2 is the argument that we need to put for our percent point uh, probability function. And why divided to 2? Because we have a two-sample test. So uh, because we have a two-sided two-sample test, sorry. 
So if you want to understand this difference between uh, two sample um, tests, two-sided tests, please check out the uh, Fundamental Statistics course at Lunar Tech because we cover this uh, topic in detail and it's a very involved topic. It contains many complexities uh, from statistical point of view. So I won't be spending, in this case, too much time on that. Here I'm assuming that you know this formula already. But if you don't, and if you quickly need to do your case study in A-B testing, feel free just, just to copy this line, which basically is a value that we need based on the corresponding chosen statistical significance level that we need to compute to compare our test statistics. So our test statistics is this value, and the value that we need to compare it to is the Z critical value. So we can see that this critical value is then equal to 1.96. This is actually a very common value that we know even without looking at a standard normal table. When you make use of this test enough often, then you know that the uh, critical value corresponding to a two-sided test when it comes to a normal table is equal to uh, 1.96. This is just the value that we know. And in here, by even without calculating the next step, which is the p-value, we can even say already what is the decision we need to make in terms of statistical significance. Because we know that one way we can test our hypothesis, statistical hypothesis, is by computing the test statistics and checking whether the test statistics, the absolute value of it, is larger than the critical value. And we see that the test statistics is equal to minus 59.56. The absolute value of that is 59.56, and that value is much larger than our critical value, which is equal to 1.96. This already gives us an idea that we can reject our null hypothesis at 5% statistical significance level. But I want to uh, go on to the next step, actually, because that's a um, more structured, more organized way to doing and conducting experimentations as in the industry, we tend to make use of the p-values instead of making use of this econometrical approach and statistical approach of um, testing the statistical test. So once we have calculated our test statistics, the next thing we need to do is to calculate our p-value and then use that p-value compared to the significance level alpha and then make a decision whether we need to reject our null hypothesis and say that we have a statistical significance or we cannot reject our null hypothesis and then we need to say that we don't have a statistical significance or we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So the idea here is that we need to make use of our uh, normal function and specifically the norm.sf, so making use of exactly the same library, the norm from scipy, that's that's. And then this time we're using the survival function, which is the one minus the cumulative distribution function of normal distribution. This comes again from statistics. And then using the absolute value of our test statistics, multiplying it by two, given that we have a two-sided test, I'm calculating my p-value. This is simply by making use of the same formula that we saw when we were uh, studying the A-B test from a technical point of view, because we learned that the p-value is then the probability that z will be smaller than or equal to the minus test statistics or that the test statistic is smaller than or equal to z. So uh, we basically want to calculate what is this probability, the p-value, which is equal to the probability that our test statistics will be smaller than the critical value or our negative of the test statistics will be larger than or equal of the critical value. And we want to know this probability. Because what this probability represents is that what is the chance that we will get a large test statistics? Well, this is due to a random chance and not because we have a, a actual statistical difference between the click-through rate of the experimental group versus control group. So this is the idea behind p-value. So what is this chance that we are uh, mistaking this random mistake, this random observation that we got a large test statistic and saying that there is a statistical significance, 
Well, there is no such thing. And we are purely getting this large test statistics um, because of the random chance. If the probability of getting a large test statistics by random chance is small, so if this p-value is small, then we can say that we have a statistical significance. That's the idea behind it. And this p-value, when we calculate, uh, we are storing it in this variable called p underscore value. And then the next thing what I'm doing is that I'm writing this function called is statistically significant, which takes uh, arguments as p-value in alpha. So I just need the p-value that I just calculated for my test, set, uh, test uh, statistics. And then I want the statistical significance level that I want to use for my test. And then this is the value that comes from my power analysis. As I mentioned before, that's the 5%. This p-value I'm calculating for my test statistics. So in here, and then I'm taking the two and I want to compare them. So I want to assess whether I have a statistical significance by comparing my p-value to my statistical significance level alpha. And what is this comparison? Well, we know uh, from the theory that uh, if we have a low p-value and specifically in the p that we are getting, the p-value is more than equal the 5% or 0 0.05, which is the significance level, then this indicates that we have a strong statistical uh, evidence that uh, the null hypothesis is false and we need to reject it. So we have a strong evidence against the null hypothesis. And otherwise, if the p-value is larger than 0 0.05, so it's larger than 5%, that we have chosen as the maximum threshold of that mistake, so the significance level, is uh, uh, no longer the largest element, but the p-value is larger than your significance level, then this indicates that you don't have enough evidence against the null hypothesis. So your evidence is weak. This means that you fail to reject the null hypothesis. So this is what I'm doing in here with this code. So I'm saying print the p-value first, and we are rounding it up with this round function. I'm rounding it to the three decimal. And then I want to check and determine whether I have a statistical significance or not. And the way that I'm doing that is I'm saying if my p-value is more than my alpha, or actually let's add smaller than equal than alpha, then we can print that there is a statistical significance which indicates that the observed differences between the experimental and control groups are un unlikely to occur due to random chance, which means that this is not random chance and uh, we have a strong evidence that there is a statistical significance. And this suggests that this new feature that we got, this new version of our landing page with this um, uh, call to action um, as the end row now, is better and results in higher, statistically significantly higher click-through rate than the existing version of the control uh, group. So there is a real effect. Then otherwise, if this is not the case, which means that my p-value is larger than my alpha, then I'm saying print that there is no statistical significance and that the observed difference that we see in the click-through rate is not because uh, of the real difference in the performance, but tru truly this is just a random chance. So here we can see that once we run our, we call the function in here, which is simply the function name and the argument, so p value and alpha. Alpha comes from the initialized value that we had from our power analysis. So from here, we initialize this value, 0 0.05, and then here, we got the p-value that we just calculated, then what we are getting in here is that our p-value is actually so small that it's um, rounded to the zero. So what this means is that, that there is evidence that suggests that at 5% statistical level, significance level, that the uh, click-through rate of the experimental group is different from the click-through rate of the control group. Note that I'm not saying higher or lower because our statistical test was two-sided. So under null hypothesis, we had that the uh, P control, so in here, as you can see, our P control was equal to P experimental. And under the alternative, we had that the P control is not equal to P experimental. This means that we um, 
have now rejected the null hypothesis, we have found evidence that suggests that the uh, null hypothesis can be rejected since our p-value is zero and it's smaller than the statistical significance level 5%. And this means that we can reject the H null and we can say that uh, there is enough evidence to say that p-control is not equal to p-experiment. And given that, that we saw from the uh, visualizations and from our calculations that the um, click-through rate for our experimental group is much higher than the click-through rate of the uh, control group, we can also say that we have found evidence that at 5% significance level, we have found out that there is a statistically significant difference between the experimental and control group's click-through rate and that the experimental group's click-through rate is actually higher, so statistically significantly higher than the control version's click-through rate. So this is really important because this suggests that this difference in their click-through rate is not due to random chance alone, but truly that there is evidence, statistical evidence that can support this hypothesis that there is a true difference between the performance of the experimental version of the product. So in this case, in our case, the landing page that has enroll now button versus the control version of the product, which had the uh, uh, start free trial version of the landing page, the existing version. So beside of calculating this p-value, it's always a great practice to also visualize your results. And this is great for your audience who are technically sound and who know uh, these different concepts. And you want to visualize uh, the results that you got, not only by showing some number that is the p-value and say, hey, I have a statistical significance, but you also want to showcase the actual picture of what you got, what is your test statistic, what is the significance level that you use to kind of tell a story around your numbers. And that's the uh, art behind the data science, I would say. So let's go ahead and do some art. So what I'm doing here is that I am making use of my standard normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, the way that we are referring to the standard normal distribution in statistics. I'm saying that my mean or the mu is equal to zero, my sigma is equal to one, which is my standard deviation. And I'm saying that my uh, I want to now plot my uh, standard normal distribution by getting my uh, x values, which are the uh, number of uh, x elements that I want to have my x axis, and then taking the PDF or the probability distribution function for the normal distribution by using the SciPy library, I'm then providing my x values for which I want to get my uh, corresponding uh, values of y. So basically, here are all the values between, let's say, minus something minus three and then so between minus three and three and i want to find all the y's corresponding to this which basically plus the probability distribution function of the gaussian distribution or the standard normal distribution and then i want to add to this graph also the uh, corresponding rejection region and as you can see it is here so then what i'm adding here by using this part of the plot is that I want to fill in the rejection regions. So I'm saying for all the values in this figure, whenever the uh, value is lower than that threshold, in this case, the threshold is the Z critical, 1.96. So whenever my threshold is smaller than minus this uh, 1.96 and larger than this 1.96, then we are in the rejection region. We are saying then, if my test statistics is falling in the rejection region, in this case, you can see that we are in the far left. So the test statistic is minus 59.44, and it's much lower than this threshold, as you can see in here. This is this left blue line in here. Then in this case, it falls in this rejection region. So actually, this entire thing is the rejection region. It starts from here and it goes all the way to here. Anything, anything in this region means that we need to, we have a test statistic falling in the rejection region, which means that we can reject the null hypothesis. If we were to get a test statistic that is very 
large and very positive, it means we would be in this part of the figure and again in the rejection region. Anything above this line is then uh, going under this category of rejection region. And also anything in here. So for anything in here, we are in the rejection region. Being in the rejection region, it means that we can reject the null hypothesis and we can say that we have a statistically significant results. So now when we have our statistical significance, it's always a great idea to go on to the next step. And it's actually mandatory to do this because not only a statistical significance is important, but also the practical significance, as I mentioned in the beginning of this case study. So for that, what we are going to do is first we are going to calculate the confidence interval of the test. And this confidence interval will help us to, first of all, make um, comments regarding the quality of our test and its generalizability uh, at our entire population and the accuracy of our results. And then we will use this confidence interval to make a comments and to test for the practical significance in our A-B test. So let's go ahead and calculate the confidence interval. So as we learned as part of our lectures, the confidence interval can be calculated by first taking the uh, P experimental head and P control head and the standard error and the Z critical. So here we need the two different estimates of the experimental groups click-through rate and the control groups click-through rate. We also need the standard error of our two sample Z test as well as the critical value and then we need to first calculate the lower bound of our confidence interval. And then we need to calculate the upper bound of our confidence interval. And in this case, uh, given that the um, statistical significance level we are using is alpha, uh, the uh, Z-critical is based on that. Therefore, we are also saying that we are calculating the 95% confidence interval. So... In here, the way we will calculate the lower bound is by taking the p-experimental head, subtracting from that the p-control head, and then once we have done that, we then subtract from that the standard error multiplied by z-critical volume. And we are just rounding this up up to the three decimal behind the zero. Then we are doing the same thing only with a plus sign in here for the upper bound calculation of the confidence interval. So this is just pure following the formula of the confidence interval that I will set you here. And let's go ahead and print this volume, which is this interval. So what we are seeing here is that we have a confidence interval that is from 0 0.399, so 0 0.4, to 0 0.43. So quite a narrow confidence interval, I would say, which is actually a good sign, because this confidence interval that provides this range of values within which the true difference between this control and experimental group's proportions or the click-through rate is likely to lie within a certain level of confidence, in this case 95% confidence, this is very narrow. And if it's a narrow confidence interval, it means that the uh, accuracy of our results is higher and it means that the results we are getting based on our smaller sample, it will most likely generalize well when we apply these changes and deploy these changes and we put this new product in front of the entire population of users. Because now we are doing all this experiment for a small group for the sample. And this confidence interval that is narrow, it's not wide, it's narrow. It means that the results that we are getting is are accurate, more or less accurate. And this means that we, the results that we are getting based on a sample are most likely a true representation of the entire population that we got. This is the idea behind the width of the confidence interval. The narrower it is, the higher uh, is the quality of your results, which means that the uh, more generalizable are your results. So let's now go on to the final stage of our case study, which is to test the practical significance of our results. So now when we know that the uh, statistical significance is there, the experimental version of our feature is statistically significantly different from the control version in terms of the click-through rate. And we have seen that the confidence in interval is narrow, which means that our results are accurate, quite uh, with quite high accuracy. Then we can now comment on the practical significance of our results. This means we want to see whether the 
significant difference that we obtained, whether this difference is actually large enough from the business perspective to say that it's worth to put our engineering resources and our money and our uh, uh, product into uh, to put through through this change and to uh, say that it's worth from the business perspective to change this button and to put this into uh, the production and in front of our users. And of course, here we are not only talking about the engineering resources that it will take from us to change this and the deployment and the monitoring, but also in terms of the quality of the product we are providing to our users. Because whenever we are making a change to our product, it is a risk because we are changing what our user is used to see. And this can always be scary uh, when it comes to uh, to the business because we don't want to uh, make our customers scared. So therefore, we need to also check for this practical significance. So for that, what I'm doing is that I'm creating this Python function that will take two arguments, so two values, that is the minimum detectable effect, and then the 95% confidence interval that I just calculated. Those will be the two arguments for my function, and I'm calling this function, is practically significant. And this function will go and check whether the uh, practical significance is there or not. And it will then return true or false. And then it will also print whether we have a practical significance or not. And we learned from a theory and we know from this A-B testing concept that whenever the uh, MDE or the delta that we got, the minimum detectable effect, is larger than the lower bound of our confidence interval, it means that the lowest possible value that we can get based on the results that we obtain in our sample, that that amount is smaller than the minimum detectable effect that we assumed before even conducting our A-B test. This suggests that we have a practical significance and the difference, the minimum difference that we will obtain is large enough for us to have a motivation to make this change in our product. For that, what I'm doing is that first I'm taking my 95% confidence interval and I'm taking the first element because we know that a confidence interval is actually a range, so a tuple of two numbers, the lower bound and upper bound. I need the lower bound because all I care for this practical significance is to compare the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval to this minimum detectable effect, which is my delta. So therefore, I'm taking this lower bound of confidence interval, putting that into a variable, and then I'm using this variable, this lower underscore bound underscore CI confidence interval, and I'm comparing this to my delta. I'm saying if my lower bound of the confidence interval, actually, I'm noticing that here I got a mistake. It should be the other way around. We need to say that if our delta is larger or equal the uh, lower bound of the confidence interval, which is the same as if our lower bound of the confidence interval is smaller than equal our delta. So if our, we can also write this the other way around. So if our delta is larger than equal than our lower underscore bound underscore ci, then we can say that we have a practical significance. So with the MDE of, in this case, so I want to use my initial delta, therefore I won't be initializing this. So you might recall here a delta of 10%. I want to still make use of that delta. So therefore I will just go ahead and then in here, what I want to do is to call this function by using that specific delta. So I want to have a 10% as my MDE. And whenever this delta will be larger than the lower bound of my confidence interval that I just obtained, I will then say that we have a practical significance. And with an MDE of 10%, the difference between control and experimental group is also practically significant. So you can see that the lower bound is 0 0.04, something that we obtain in here. And that amount is then compared to this delta. And here you can see that we have concluded that we also have a practical significance. 
So amazing. We have come to the end of this case study. And in this involved case study, we have conducted an entire um, A-B test results analysis. So this case study in A-B test. And to end, going from the point of loading the data and then understanding this business concept or business objective of A-B test where we were testing whether the um, enroll now button, which is the new version, the experimental version, should replace the existing button, which is the secure free trial. And based on this case study, what we found out is that we have a statistical significance at 5% significance level, suggesting that we can reject the null hypothesis and we can say that indeed there exists a statistical significant difference between the click-through rate in the experimental group versus control group uh, and specifically that the enroll now experimental button results in statistically significantly higher click-through rate than the uh, secure free trial button. And beside this, we also checked the um, accuracy of our results by looking at a confidence interval. And we saw that the confidence interval was quite narrow, suggesting that the results we obtained were quite uh, accurate. And this means that the results that we got for the sample will generalize to our population of users. And finally, we have also checked the practical significance of our results by using the 95% confidence interval and comparing the lower bound of that interval with our minimum detectable effect delta. And we saw that we will have at least 10% uh, significant difference between the control groups CTR and the control, uh, the experimental group CTR and the experimental group CTR will be at least 10% higher than the uh, control groups. And this suggests that uh, from the business perspective, we also have a motivation uh, beside of this statistical significance, we also have practical significance suggesting that we also have uh, enough motivation and reason from the business perspective to put this new button into production. So we can conclude that uh, based on this data-driven approach and conducting an A-B testing, we uh, can see a clear motivation of deploying this new button and roll now and replace the existing one secure free trial version. And we will then expect to see more users clicking on this and engaging with our product. And for now, this will be all for this case study. If you want to learn more about A-B testing, make sure to check our A-B testing course as well as the Ultimate Data Science Bootcamp. Don't forget to try our free trial, this time using our Enroll Now button. And if you want to see more case studies like this, make sure to check our other case studies. We have many case studies also included as part of our Ultimate Data Science Bootcamp, where we go in detail of these different steps and we conduct different sorts of case studies to put our data science theory into practice, including from the field of NLP, machine learning, recommender systems, advanced analytics, and also A-B testing, and soon also from AI. So for now, Thank you for staying with me and conducting this case study. Happy learning. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, make sure to check all the other videos available on this channel. And don't forget to subscribe, like and comment to help the algorithm to make this content more accessible to everyone across the world. And if you want to get free resources, make sure to check the free resources section at lunartech.ai. And if you want to become a job ready data scientist and you are looking for this accessible bootcamp that will help you to make it job ready data scientist, consider enrolling to the data science bootcamp. The ultimate data science bootcamp at lunartech.ai, you will learn all the theory, the fundamentals to become a job ready data scientist. You will also implement the learn theory into a real world multiple data science projects. Beside this, after learning the theory and practicing it with the real-world case studies, you will also prepare for your data science interviews. And if you want to stay up to date with the recent developments in tech, what are the headlines that you have missed in the last week, what are the open positions currently in the market across the globe, and what are the tech startups that are making waves in the tech, and sure to subscribe to the Data Science and AI newsletter from Lunar Tech.